Hey there. Welcome back. Uh, a couple videos ago, I think I promised you or told you or hinted that I bought myself a new toy for Christmas. Well, I don't know if it's for Christmas, but you know what I mean. And I wanted to share it with you. So that's what this video is all about. My new, my new, um, fun thing to play with. So I came up with a little idea of something inspired by a couple other videos that I watched of other YouTubers. And uh, so I thought I would show you my new toy today while sharing um, a fun little Christmas project. And I can't even name all the different YouTubers that have inspired me because you know how it is. You go down a rabbit hole and then YouTube just keeps suggesting other ones and things. It all started with... Uh, Kate at the last homely house. I love her. I just kind of want to grow up and be her. Maybe I'm already halfway there. I'm not sure. I just don't have that wonderful Northern English um, accent that she has and um, all the wonderful talent and gifts and beautiful things she makes. But she was making some Christmas stockings out of Liberty fabrics. Uh, and I do not have the access to Liberty Fabrics at this time, but I do have access to lots and lots and lots of random hand dyes and batiks and velvets and silks and little bits and pieces like this of all of the above. And she did strip piecing, long strips and stitched and flipped and stitched and flipped on a piece of batting, wadding, if you will, if you're British. And um, then cut it into a stocking shape and made a lined stocking that was patchworked on one side and it was really cute. Well, and then someone else, and I believe it was Shannon, that Shannon makes, I think that's her channel. If I can find these actual videos again, because I probably didn't save them, but if I can find them again, I'll link them in the, in the description below so you can watch what they did. Um, but she is a seamstress, sewist, and circus artist from Canada. I believe she lives in Montreal. Anyway, she made a project bag um, that was, what's the word I want? Not scrappy, although it was scrappy. Um, crazy quilted. I love crazy quilts. Now she used a different method of crazy quilting than I am going to use and that I typically use. So um, no shade. The way she did it was really cool and it worked for her because she was working in airports and traveling and didn't have a sewing machine handy. So I like the way she did, may do, um, you know, may do with what she, what she had available to her, which was really cool. And it turned out super cute. So I'm going to combine these two ideas from these two makers and a few others that like I said, I found and, um, make a crazy quilt Christmas stocking for my uh, mantle. Um, I feel like Nellie here is asking for something more authentic to the era and crazy quilting is a very Victorian kind of look and I have a very eclectic look and a kind of a maximalist look about here and I also have a crazy quilt table throw that my sister made me many years ago and, uh, well, let me go get that and I'll show it to you because I don't think I've ever shared that with you. I might. Okay, here we are. Um, I'm back. And this is the table throw that she made me many, many years ago. It's, it's like a cotton velveteen. And then the center is crazy patched, crazy quilted, and then lots of little bits of hand embroidery at the seam lines. It's a fun technique, and um, I've been doing a lot of knitting in the last few months, and I just decided I wanted, if I'm gonna sit and uh, in front of the television, in front of my little new electric fireplace, and do hand work, I wanna change it up a little bit. And I don't know, I mean, I have until, I have a couple weeks till Christmas, so there's a chance that my stocking will get up before Christmas. Anyhow, I'm gonna show you how I did it, but. First, I have to introduce you um, to the new tool in my toolbox that I'm going to use to patchwork this crazy quilt 
stocking. So let me go get her and show her to you. Okay, my quilting and sewing friends, sewing machine friends will probably know already what this is. And I'm going to actually come around the other side and flip her around so she has a little better lighting. It's kind of a gray winter day and I don't have the greatest light. There you go. It's a little better view of her. For you non-sewing machine aficionados and non-quilters, this is what is called a Singer Featherweight. And you saw the cute little box that she comes in, case and everything, and she weighs about 11 pounds. Uh, considerably lighter, about a quarter the weight and size of my big machine. So I can set her up here on my dining table and watch TV at night and have my little fire over there on the other side of the yellow chair and so if I get a little better lighting in here, but that's another thing, I bring my ot light in here and we can st I can take her places and I adore her. She came with the case, as you saw, you can see what excellent condition she's in. She has her owner's manual in the book in here, some um, things from the Featherweight shop. It's a great online resource if you're a Featherweight person six original bobbins so there's these five and there's one in it and the original bobbin case and all the accessory feet that you could want i did order myself a nice quarter inch foot from the featherweight shop and oops there goes my thread and then if you know something about featherweights something i had never heard of before but evidently this is a thing and it is See up here, the, this, the woman I bought her from just had a couple of little pieces of flannel up here to kind of protect the finish of the top of the machine and to help your spool spin easier. Well, evidently, there's a thing called spool doilies. And of course, I couldn't just go on Etsy or somewhere and order a spool doily. No, I had to go look through my stash and find all my crochet cotton and make myself a nice little collection of, and I haven't buried the thread, I haven't cleared up the thread on a, a lot of them, but these I think are a little too big. They were my first uh, experiments in spool doily making, although that one's kind of fun. But again, I feel like it might be a little big for the purpose. But these are perfect. See, look at that. Look how cute that is. And then I'm going to put my spool thread on. Perfect. And it'll protect it. So that was fun. I uh, got to make, to do a little bit of, again, I got to take care of my ends there. A little more making for my, my new machine. She runs beautifully. I have tested her and done a couple seams here and there with her, but uh, right after I got her, things started kind of going sideways. I won't go into detail, but um, I didn't. I haven't had a lot of time to do as much with her. I didn't, things didn't go sideways. I just got busy with a lot of things and wasn't home and able to work with her as much as I would, would have liked. We'll just put it that way. So anyhow, I'm gonna thread her up and I'm gonna take you through how I go about making my crazy quilt patchwork.
Have I got gotten spoiled by automatic needle threaders on my fancy uh, machine? Maybe, but also the other challenge I have um, is that these little machines thread right to left rather than front to back like we're used to in our modern machines. And um, bifocals, that's all I'm gonna say. If you're of a certain age and you have progressive lenses, bifocals, you might know what I'm talking about, that if, if you don't get the, the lens in just the right place, um, you might have a problem. Okay, where's my little starter? Let's see how she's sewing today. I haven't uh, had her out of the box in a couple weeks, so we're gonna see how she sews today. Hopefully, she sews like a charm. Perfect. You also notice she is extremely quiet, which I just love. But that is about as perfect of a stitch as you are going to get on any modern machine, on any machine. So that's why the filters, we love that. So I'm going to scoot her back a little bit and talk to you about this, how we're going to do this. So what I've done, I've made a pattern, and I know that you can find a basic Christmas stocking shaped pattern many places online. So if you don't want to freehand it like I did, if I find some, I'll put them in the, in the description here, but um, I know they're out there. Just Google free template Christmas stocking, and then you can scale them whatever size you want. And then I traced it out on a, just a piece of lightweight cotton batting. You could use poly, polyester batting, whatever you have. You could even use um, felt or something, but this is what I have. And um, I haven't really started selecting my fabrics too much. I just kind of tossed them in a pile over here. And I don't have an iron happening in here either, which may end up being an issue. But we're going to grab some of these sneaky snack, scrappy scraps. And I'll probably end up making more than one. I think I'm going to start with making one out of all these little bit, maybe not all these little bits of um, batiks and hand dyes. But I also found some silks and some velvets in my stash. So I think that would make a really nice, um, rich looking stocking as well. So we'll just, we're going to play and see what we find. And you don't want a lot of teeny, teeny, tiny pieces because you want some areas to embellish. So I'm going to start. Um, I have such a mess here. But usually what I like to do, okay, I'm going to take this kind of weird color. I might need to go get an iron. And usually what I like to do is start with kind of an odd shape, usually five, or five sides at least. So, just uh, just cut a piece. Oh yeah, I'm gonna have to go iron. Maybe not. Maybe I can hand press these out. So that's my starting piece. And don't worry if it's like really, really wonky like this and doesn't have a straight edge because that's what you're gonna make next. And then you're going to take another piece that can be like a, a straight straight edge. And you're just going to put it, making sure you cover whatever edge. Okay, let me pull my machine back down here where I can sew on her. And we'll turn the light on. Now, that's another thing a lot of people don't know when they first get an old machine singer like this. Is that the, the, the switch over here that just turns the light on. It doesn't power the machine. If the machine is plugged in, the machine is ready to go. If you want to know more about antique singers and antique featherweights and things like that, there's lots of resource there are lots of resources out there. Um, I just wanted to share my new one. And you don't have to worry with this technique, you don't have to worry about seam allowances or anything. I'm just going to use the straight edge of this red material. This is my guide, and I'm going to sew. 
and I'm going to sew off the past the line here that I have drawn on my on my base fabric or my base um, um, batting. And then you can cut this little overhanging piece off if you want, and it does kind of make it thinner underneath and a little easier to work with if you do. And we have cat fights happening. And then you're just gonna press that up, okay? And then grab another piece. How about this weird bright green? Cats. Obviously, I cut some leaf shapes out of this bright green. I'm trying to get kind of a straight edge here, okay. Oops. And the beauty of hand dyes and, and batiks is there really are no right and wrong sides to the fabric. So that makes it a little easier. So you see here I have this little notch. I want to be sure that that gets covered in my seam uh, allowance because it's on the fabric. So I'm actually happen to just have a little notch on that. Well, no, I want to bring it down here. Not waste fabric. So I'm going to be sure my seam allowance is going to be a little deeper on this one because I want to be sure I cover up. I, I don't have that hanging open, if that makes sense. So now, now I did see this tip on the Featherweight YouTube channel that they start with the needle in the fabric. I have never done that with any machine I have ever owned, so that's going to have to be something I'm going to have to get used to if it's something I determined that I have to, to do. <laughs> All right. I'm going to pull this out. And again, if I had a lot of weird overhang, I would deal with it, but I don't. So now I'm just going to flip this like that. And of course, these guys are going to have to go. I just know they are, so I must just get rid of them now. And then I'm just going to proceed like that. So, so you see I have this weird thing here. I can make that, well, I don't even have to cut it to make it more of a straight edge. Let's grab a piece that will fit there. This and you kind of want to also see if when you when you're when you do it this way when you're going to flip it back over is it going to cover or leave any weird edges um, over over here. So like if I were to do that, nah, that's going to cover it. So I'm going to kind of go. Actually, I'm going to use that brown edge, and I'm going to go from here. Okay my needle down, see how that works. And I'm not going to keep going off here because it, it, that's not going to work. <laughs> you're, you're just kind of building the edges. So now I can cut this green overhang off. And I'm going to, well, we'll flip first. And then I'm gonna flip, finger press. But see, I, in order to fill this space, I'm gonna have to either go across here or across here. I'll, I'll leave it hanging over here for now. We'll see how it, we'll see how we fill that space. Probably what I should have done was fill this space, heel space first, and then put that one on. But, but you're, you're basically kind of working your way around and just adding on, adding on. And I'm just random. I'm not trying to do like Christmas colors necessarily. Because again, I just want this to be fun, happy. Nope, that's not a wide enough piece. Um, colors for um, jewel tones. I'm not really looking for Christmas as per se. So this one's going to go, you know, it's going to go here, but I got to kind of flip it. Kind of, uh, how far up? It could go all the way up. Can it, can it go up that way? Mm, it's barely going to reach that edge if it does that. So we'll, we'll do this. Give us another edge. Uh, hmm. Maybe that. That's what it's going to do. Okay. And then that flips. 
so now that that edge the heel edge is covered now I've got to put something in here I mean you could do Y seams but I'm not going to not going to I'm not gonna happen that little hot pink might be pretty right there or just not yeah so I'm going to quit talking and just keep adding fabrics and um, maybe do a little time lapse while I finish filling in the spaces. And you can watch me do that. And then we'll go from there. Okay, now that you have your entire outline covered with stitched and flipped fabric, you can go through and give it a press if you want. I recommend it. I'm just being lazy today. And then I'm going to take my template and um, lay it back over here. And it doesn't have to match up exactly with what you covered up. You just want to be sure that there's no nothing sticking out around that there that there is fabric coming around all the sides of your template and then I'm gonna draw a sewing line around here which I'm going to go get some chalk and then I'm gonna stitch that down so let me come right back hold on okay here we are a little chalk pencil I need to go tape that edge that I miscut or just changed my mind at the last minute, whatever you want to call it. And I have green chalk, so my line might be hard to see on some of these green fabrics. We'll make it do we'll make it work. I could just use an ink pen because it's all gonna be in a seam allowance. If I can't see it I will. Uh here we go. All right, close enough for who it's for. Okay, now we're going to just sew around that line that I sort of drew, just to catch all these edges. Is all we're doing is just giving yourself a finished, semi-finished edge all the way around here. on the toe. Here we go. I can see it. since I went past the line. And now all I'm going to do is just trim off my excess all the way around. I'm not gonna trim right at, this, at the um, line I stitched, although that will be my stitching line when I put this all together at the end. But I'm just gonna leave myself a little extra 
wiggle room. So there's my basic pieced stocking front. And I mean, if you like that, you can leave it at that. If you have a modern machine with a whole bunch of decorative stitches and a bunch of pretty threads, you could go along each of these stitch lines and do a different, uh, many of your di different decorative threads, decorative stitches, and do it that way. If you have an embroidery machine and you wanted to put a little embroidery motif uh, in some of these sections, you could do that. If you have an embroidery machine and you wanted to make a band or you know, make a more solid piece up here, kind of like I did with this bit of green, um, and embroider a name on it, you could do that. There's a lot of options. I am going to choose to hand embroider along here as in as if it were a real a, a traditional crazy quilt I think this one with the, the modern batiks and the modern hand dyed fabrics I might use my other machine to decorate this one and then off camera make another one out of the silks and velvets in the more traditional sense this is my prototype my proof of concept this is a fun prototype it's they're fun bright colors i think they're gonna look really pretty in my front parlor for christmas um, with my per my green walls and my purple couch and my jewel tones in there but i have quite the stack here as you can see quite the pile of miscellaneous fabrics so i think i can make some more stockings so I think I'm, today I'm just going to sit here, I'm going to turn my TV back on and quit recording and um, watch some Doctor Who and make some more tops, fronts of, um, of these stockings. And then I'll have a little selection and I can decide if I want to machine embellish them or if I want to hand embellishment, uh, embellish them or a little bit of both. Let's finish up this stocking project. And so, as you can see, I made a few. <laughs> this is the one I started with, I believe. And this, and then I, I just kept going and had some different ideas. I had a lot of random strips of batiks and hand dyes, So I kind of did this stitch and flip strips where I kind of put them at different angles so that I, I didn't just have straight lines, but and then I did kind of a, a contha cloth type um, hand stitching on that one to give it some, I'm trying to get it where you can maybe see, some texture and interest. And then this one is all cottons and batiks. And I took it over to my, let's see if I can move this camera and get better light. There we go. Um, I took it into the other room on the big machine with all the fancy decorative stitches, put different threads in there, and did all the different seams with all the different decorative stitches from my sewing machine. And that was much quicker than hand stitching, all those little seams and a different variety. This one I haven't stitched yet. It's it's coming. It's This one is the silks and the velvets. And I'm, I'm thinking of machine embroidering something there and I haven't picked something and done that one yet so that one I'm not going to finish yet and then this one is completely finished uh, I need a little press and maybe a little bit of a top stitch around the top to keep the, the um, lining from popping through but as you can see this is also silk and velvet and I hand embroidered all of the designs on this one 
even some metallic thread, which was a pain in the, the toot. And it has a velvet backing and a, um, it's not silk lining, just a, but a lining. But I haven't pressed the lining down yet. Uh, it's no way to really, I couldn't, I don't think I could have understitched it either when it was open. So I think I'll take it in on the bigger machine and top stitch around the top. But I also had a couple spots here where my seam allowance kind of did some weird things. So I'm just going to take a needle and thread and ladder stitch those closed so that you know, it's complete. But this one is for me. It's for my um, my parlor, my fireplace. And as you can see, I don't, you know, it's not a very big um, stocking. You're not going to get anything real large in there, but it'll be pretty. Well, I'll put them up later and we'll see. So let me show you how I'm going to go about finishing these, how I finish this one. And let's, uh, let's do this one. Now, I did laminate my stocking pad. Okay, I laminated this pattern because I happen to have, have a laminator. That's a backstory that you don't need to hear, but I didn't buy it. Let's just put it that way. It was acquired. I didn't steal it either. But I thought, well, if I want to make a bunch of these um, stockings, having a stiff pattern, reusable pattern will be nice. But I will show you something. Um, they're not, now that one I stitched around, you know, here, now that one's already been turned, but there's something about the stitching and the trimming and the hand stitching that kind of sometimes makes them be a different size. So rather than using this pattern for cutting my lining and my backing, uh, on these, I'm going to just use the stockings themselves. So let's do this one. So I need two pieces of lining and one piece of backing. I've decided to back and line this one with cotton rather than the velvet and the silky lining because that was kind of a, to be quite frank, it was kind of a pain in the butt to sew on the little machine. So I'm going to take this piece of, I, have a, I don't know why or where, this fabric came from but you can can you see on camera I don't know if you can as it catches the light it has sparkle in it it's kind of fun and I've had it forever and I have too much of it it's falling off the table okay so what I'm going to do this is going to be well is this I'm trying to decide if it's going to be my lining or my backing so I'm going to that be my backing fabric and then I'm going to take uh, something to line it with and I think yes okay now the beauty of fabrics like this is that there's no right side or wrong side if they're if you were using a fabric like this one that has a right side and wrong side, I would put them right sides, fold them right sides together. But these are my two linings, and this is my backing. I'm going to just make a little sandwich here. I, this is not the best working situation. Stack these up. Then I'm going to put, because this is my backing, and the right side of my backing, I need to put my stocking right side down on it and uh, I can pin it all three layers if I had a cutting mat under it I probably wouldn't even do that because this, this cotton is not going to slide around like um, the silk and velvet we're doing uh, the other one and then I would cut it with my rotary cutter but I don't have that in here because I'm working in the blue room in the lounge in front of the television. Okay. And so then I'm going to cut all three layers at once using the actual stocking front as my pattern. That is so much easier and more accurate because like I said, uh, 
it didn't it didn't necessarily uh, stay the same size as the pattern as I stitched it if that makes sense and well yeah yeah whatever you get the idea So now I'm going to take these pins out because so now I have two pieces of backing of lining fabric and a piece of backing fabric and the front. One more thing I need. Some way to hang the um, stocking. So I made these the other day. They're just, you know, however Four times as wide as that, so probably an inch and a half. What do we got? Is it a half inch? Okay. Uh, so probably two, probably two inches wide piece of fabric, fold in half, fold the edges in, and sew down the side. Simple, simple. And I'm going to make a loop to hang it and stick it here. And then I'm going to take a piece of my lining, right sides together with the backing, so I was pointing the same direction. I'm going to pin that little loop in there. These are silk pins. They're a little thin for what I'm doing, but they're, again, what I have in here, and they're working fine. And then I'm going to do the same thing with the back, the front piece. I'm going to line up the top edge, pin it. Yeah. And then I'll take these over to the machine. I'm just going to sew along the top. Seam allowances don't really matter. I'm going about a quarter inch because I got a quarter inch foot on the machine. And if you, you know, think your stocking is going to get a lot of wear and tear where the um, hook is, where the loop is, you know, maybe backstitch over the loop a couple times, but that's optional. And then I'll come back and show you what we do the next step. Okay, so here we are with the linings attached to the um, the back and the front okay now I'm gonna just take an extra pin and kind of just fold this little loopy thing out of the way so it doesn't accidentally get caught in my side seam okay and now I'm gonna put these right sides together and pin around matching my tops. The tops are more important than the toes to match because the um, ow, uh, the lining is just gonna go inside the boot and it, it doesn't matter if it's exact. Does that make sense? Okay. Mm. But I will. Mm. When I was using the slippery, other slippery fabric, pinning was more important. Like I said before, this cotton kind of sticks to itself, so it doesn't slide around too much, but, you know, pins. Some people are big pin people, and other people like try to avoid them like the plague. It, it, It's all, it's whatever works for you. There's sometimes you really do need pins, like when you're trying to sew velvet that has a nap that wants to slide one way to a satiny, silky lining that wants to slide a different way, pins are your friend. Now, when I sew this, I am going to start here, approximately here. Can you see that? On the, on the, right before the heel of the sock and go all the way around, actually because of the way up, it doesn't matter. I'll probably sew that way around just because of seam, the, whatever. But you know what I mean. I'm going to leave an opening here. I'm going to go all the way around, but leave an opening that I can turn right there. And uh, then the, you know, you can leave that opening open, but I'm going to sew it shut with my machine just after I turn everything uh, so that no Christmas goodies get caught between the lining and the main fabric. But... Let's go do that on the machine, and I'll come back. We'll turn it around, and we'll have a finished, basically a finished sock. So I'll show you.
so here we are. They are all stitched together. I have clipped um, notches in my curved areas so that when I turn it right side out, uh, it will be not as bulky. I also trimmed away some of the extra batting in some of those curved areas. So let's turn it right side out. If I can get my opening here. Here we go. Okay. I'm going to just reach in here with my hand. Oops. And grab that pin so I don't stab myself. The one that was holding the little loop out of the way. And I might need to have made this hole a little bit bigger, but and I'm just going to grab the toe. And if I was able to turn the other one right side out with bulkier fabric, I should be able to do this one. All right, we're just going to shove the toe like that a little bit. I can't get my hand. There we go. Okay. Can I share a little pet peeve of mine? I have a number of them, but this is just one when I watch um, crafting and sewing videos. When people say, I'm going to turn it inside out, no, it was already inside out. The inside was out, and now you're turning it right side out. Again, it's pedantic. It's just me being weird. But I'm wondering, is there anybody out there, anybody else out there that notices little things like that, that and it, it bothers them? Just just let me know um, that I'm not the only I mean, it's not enough to unsubscribe to somebody or, you know, be really annoyed, but it's just, it's just a thing. So I would probably go get like a wooden spoon or my dowel or something and poke down in here to really get these edges, these, um, these curves all pushed right side out and there. Now I'm going to sew up this little hole here with my sewing machine. You could be really, really fancy and, you know, um, ladder stitch it closed so it's a blind closure but it's going to be inside the stocking nobody's going to see it so just a little straight stitching across along there like at an eighth of an inch or whatever and then once you do that you're going to take this and stick it down inside the, the stocking And now that I've made these, I may modify my pattern a little bit to make it just a little roomier because these are very close little, I don't know. The proportions look nice though. I just feel like that maybe the toe could be a little bit, a little bit wider. Um, you're, you're not going to get a full size navel orange in the toe of that stocking, but maybe you don't need to. And then the top's just going to turn in like that. It's going to hang from there. If you want, you could do a row top stitching or, like on this one, since I have all this decorative machine stitching on here, maybe I would go back to the um, other machine and put in a pretty decorative stitch and top stitch a decorative stitch all the way around the top edge. And that would tie everything in and hold that edge in. But with this being cotton and cotton, cotton lining and cotton exterior, that, that really is just holding, if I pressed it, holding very nicely. So that's how you finish these little stockings. And I'm going to finish lining and backing this one and then I'm going to figure out how I'm going to stitch the other one and get it do some decorative stitching here and um finish the other one and so is it a quick gift no probably not but depending on how elaborate you go with your decorative quilting on top and who's to say you even have to do any decorative quilting that's a pretty stocking in and of itself is it a little prettier with some fancy stitching on it? Yeah, yeah, I gotta say it is. But, you know, you could just do it like that, or you could just do machine quilting uh, on it. So the hand quilting or the hand decorative stitching takes the most time of anything, but the patching it together, patchworking it or strip quilting it together, strip piecing it together, it doesn't take very long. And... Um, and then the finishing doesn't take that long. So, you know, if you need a mm, quick-ish gift for somebody, you got a day or two to make a gift and you're not going to do a lot of um, embroidery or 
you have a lot of time to do a lot of embroidery. I mean, this embroidery took me two evenings watching Doctor Who. So let that be your gauge. I don't know. Um, but it's a great way to use up scraps. I used all these rich jewel tones, A, because I had them, and B, because they go with the style um, of my house. But you could use, I think it would be really cute, with a variety of plaids and checks. Uh, it would be really a neat way to use up old neckties. Open up the neckties and use the silk from neckties. You would have some really cool prints that way. Um, whatever, or make these for your gifts for your little, if you're in a quilting uh, group or sewing circle, you know, make make some of these for gifts using up your random quilt scraps. Some ideas, kind of last minute scrappy ideas. My goal for 2024 is to continue to work through all my stash and that being fabric stash, yarn stash, dye stuff, dyeable fiber, spinnable fiber, embroidery materials, and finish up some UFOs. So once this little project is done, it's time for UFOs. So subscribe, turn on notifications, and um, come back and check out what my next stash busting project or UFO project will be. Okay, thanks for joining me. Love you, bye. But I hope you enjoyed meeting my new friend. She doesn't really have a name. Um, my my treadle machine, oh, there's Lil. Hey, Lilith. Um, was named, is named Rose. Oh, since I'm sitting here watching Doctor Who, and I already have a Rose companion... Maybe. So I turned the camera around and please excuse any mess and all any and all messes in the background. Um because I'm I'm having a thought here. My other machine is named Rose. My big Bernina, she she never got a name. I've had her for almost ten years and she never got a name. Um but so here's true true nerd confession time. I just started watching Doctor Who like this week. Well, I take that back. I watched the first season of the modern, or the first Doctor of, well, I guess it was the first season of the modern Doctors uh, with Eccleston. Doctor uh, number nine. Is that Doctor nine, number nine? Yeah. The ninth Doctor. I guess that's how you, that's how you know, Whovians say it. Um, ages ago. And then I, I, I got vetoed in the family on becoming Whovians. We weren't going to watch Doctor Who. Nobody wanted to watch it, and I didn't have time to watch it on my own. So I quit watching it. And, um, but now that I live alone and have all the time to watch the TV is my time to watch TV. I decided, well, when I started hearing about the new doctor, the new, new doctor, which is 14, 15, I don't know what we're at here. And, um, that everybody's favorite doctor who is one of my, well, not everybody's favorite doctor, but a lot of people's favorite doctor. Num number 10, doctor, the 10th doctor, um, also happens to be one of my favorite actors in general. And I've watched everything else practically that the man has ever been in. So I thought, well, I gotta watch, I hear he's coming back. I got, I gotta watch this. So, um, anyhow, I, um, am watching it and, um, I'm through to the second season of the 10th doctor is where I'm at right now. And my other machines named Rose. I had an Aunt Donna. I just watched the episodes with Martha Jones. I kind of really like her. So maybe my machine's named Martha. So get in the comments, especially any of you Whovians. Um, and you could, don't spoil anything. I know, don't blink. Everybody knows that. Let me know who your favorite companion is. Let me know who your favorite doctor is. And... What you think maybe I should name this machine. And there's really no saying that a sewing machine has to be female. I mean, we're living in a non-binary world, right? Uh, so this companion could be a male companion, although she does give off a lot of very female feminine energy. But again, just because something is giving off feminine energy doesn't necessarily mean it's female. 
are we going to have that conversation on my YouTube channel? No, no, we are not. But it's um, something that's been on my mind lately anyway. But I hope you enjoyed this project before we get too deep of a dive into where my brain has been going lately. And I hope you have, if I don't see you again before the Christmas holidays, if you celebrate Christmas or Yule, and I know we're in Hanukkah right now, so if you are celebrating Hanukkah, um, Mazel Tov, I don't know if that's not right. Happy Hanukkah. <laughs> This was fun, and I hope you enjoy my new companion and uh, love her as much as I do. Well, I know you don't love her as much as I do, but I hope you appreciate how much I love her. So for now, I'm going to get back to sewing and hooing, hooing, Dr. Hooing, viewing, hewing, hew viewing. Is that a thing? It is now. Okay, and um, breaking up cat fights. But evidently, Lilith has decided that this pile of fabric, can you see this, is here for her. Of course, everything in this house is there for her, as far as she's concerned, except for the new cat, which, ooh, the cat's out of the bag. But I think y'all know, right? Maybe? Maybe not. That'll be an upcoming video whenever you get to meet her. Uh, okay, I have a couple new companions around this house, so... But this is the one I wanted to introduce you to today. Let's get her in the shot. Come on, baby. I'm going to turn that light off. I have not replaced the bulb in here with the new LED bulb yet because um, I rarely actually use that little light uh, anyway. But, okay. Talk to you later. Bye.